will continue calling, knocking on doors, walking down paths and, until we do bring Michael home. Next on KVAL News, the parents of Michael Bryson are keeping their search efforts going six months after his disappearance while camping with friends. We have new information on the investigation tonight. Plus, Monday is an unofficial deadline. The Oregon School Activities Association is pressed to make a decision on the fate of contact sports at the high school level. Our Brandon Cameraman with the details. And a special Health Watch report tonight, dating during COVID. Jacqueline Fernandez takes an in-depth look at what it's like to go on a date during the pandemic. From the combined newsrooms in Eugene, Roseburg, and Coos Bay, KVAL News starts now. I'm asking older Oregonians for patience in exchange for this promise. While it will take time, every senior who wants to get vaccinated will get a vaccine in the coming weeks. That's Pat Allen, the director of the Oregon Health Authority, talking about vaccinations for seniors. It's been a controversial choice vaccinating teachers ahead of older populations, but now starting tomorrow, seniors 80 and older can get vaccinated. Good evening. I'm Jacqueline Fernandez and I'm David Walker. Welcome to this special report of KVAL News. In just a few hours now, Oregonians 80 and older will be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. And KVAL's Keely McCormick is following the story today. Keely, does that mean all older Oregonians will be getting vaccinated this week? David, no, it does not. Once the clock strikes midnight, there will be more seniors eligible than there are vaccines available. Right now, there are 55,000 people who can get vaccinated, but tomorrow, the number of eligible people will increase to more than 1.3 million and there will likely be some confusion and frustration because of this as seniors try to navigate where when and how they can get the shot. Governor Brown acknowledges the potential conflict saying they're working on it of a new online tool that Google helped us create called get vaccinated Oregon to help Oregonians who are eligible for a vaccine. That new tool will be available tomorrow and can be found on the website covidvaccine.oregon.gov. Additionally, there is a live chat option on the site which can help you determine eligibility. In the meantime, seniors can also call 211 if you don't have an internet connection. That number is experiencing a lot of traffic right now, so much so that Governor Brown called in 30 National Guard members to help staff the call center. And Lane County's website is still partially shut down because of technical issues. There is a backup site, though, with the vaccine pre-registration link at lanecounty.org. And we'll do our best to keep you updated and let you know when that 211 number is back up and running smoothly. Until then, and for more information, head over to our website at kval.com. Back to you guys. Keely, thank you. Tomorrow, Governor Brown will be meeting with the Oregon Mayor's Association. She'll be talking about issues surrounding the pandemic. That includes county risk levels, which many Oregon mayors have been critical of. The governor is expected to be joined by the Oregon Health Authority at that meeting. New tonight, workers will soon be striking at the Rollin at Riverbend Memory Care in Springfield after a recent COVID outbreak led to six deaths. Workers say understaffing and insufficient training at the Rollin at Riverbend put residents and staff at risk. The move to strike comes after the Rollin decided to voluntarily recognize a union. Working alone with people dying and people sick, that trauma brought us together and we are such a tight group of coworkers and we are all together on this. We have already decided to become a union. That's already a decision we've made. So we just need to be recognized. Trasco says 85% of Rollin employees or about 40 people intend to strike starting February 16th. Workers delivered a strike notice on the 5th, giving the Rollin 10 days to find replacement caretakers for residents. Now, the Rollins parent company says despite the strike, they are prepared to continue around the clock care for residents. You can find their full statement on our website, kval.com. Well, for many years, we at KVAL News have been following the South Willamette Valley Honor Flight Program. They take our local veterans from Lane, Benton, Lynn, and Lincoln County to Washington, D.C. to see their memorials and to be thanked for their sacrifice and service. From the World War II Memorial to the Korean, Vietnam, and other memorials to Arlington National Cemetery, it's an amazing and at times an emotional journey. The local director of the program, Ed Bach, told me about the experience of one of the veterans on the honor flight. He's waited 50 years just for somebody to thank him. 
and that happened on the honor flight, and you could just see the emotion in his face as he he talked about it. And we've ex we've experienced that with every flight, with every uh, veteran that's gone. These men and women served any time from the beginning of World War II to the end of the Vietnam War. And so far, 715 local veterans have been taken on an honor flight. They don't pay anything for the trip. South Willamette Valley Honor Flight holds fundraisers. They take donations all to pay for those flights. It's been on many of the flights that uh, KVAL has been. I've been there with uh, LSB, our live shot buddy, telling the stories of our veterans. It is a real honor. And wherever they go, what really stands out to me is the way they are treated with the honor and the respect they deserve. And with the coronavirus pandemic, the honor flight, like so many things, had to be put on hold. And we're looking forward to when those flights can be resumed to give our local veterans that opportunity they so richly deserve. You can learn more about the Honor Flight program, including how to apply and if you wish to make a donation to support the program by going to South Willamette Valley Honor Flight org. A KVAL exclusive tonight, Kip, tips continue pouring in for the search for Michael Bryson. The now 28-year-old Harrisburg man went camping with friends near Cottage Grove last summer and never came home. And that was six months ago now. KVAL's Sean Cuellar has new information in this KVAL exclusive. The Lane County Sheriff's Office calling the Michael Bryson missing persons case one of its most extensive searches. In addition to detectives, search and rescue and volunteers, Michael's parents are a driving force vowing to bring their son home. We are going to keep his name out there. Yep. We definitely will never stop looking. Tina and Parrish Bryson have driven Rowell River Road countless times since August 5th. The day their son Michael disappeared from Hobo Campground, about 25 miles southeast of Cottage Grove. Three to four times a week, they travel this winding road, investigating tips and making sure flyers of Michael are up on trailheads, bulletin boards, and at the campsite. The Bryson shared with KVAL News some of the last pictures of Michael, taken at what some describe as a renegade or rave party in the woods. 40 to 60 people, music, drinking, and drugs. Where our car is parked here, um, that's where the, the large bus was. The bus where witnesses say Michael walked away from at four in the morning. That he got upset and walked off the bus and nobody has seen him. By the time we found out, it was almost 12 hours after he had been missing. The moment I put my foot out of that car, I knew Michael was gone. People weren't out looking for Michael. They were sitting around um, drinking, eating, laughing. Nobody was really out searching for him. So there's been a lot of conflicting stories from, from the very beginning. One story is um, that he uh, walked away from camp. And then the other story is that uh, a group of individuals picked him up on the road. The tips that come in support both of these theories. The other rumor the Brysons have heard is that their son was puddled. Puddling is a term where they give you excess amounts of, of acid um, to basically overdose you. Somebody doses you. They dose you more than what you should have. Search and Rescue didn't find any signs of foul play in August. 19 days straight, searchers along with a team of volunteers combed the area. Steep terrain with overgrowth and dense with trees. Volunteer drone pilots covering even more ground and providing a bird's eye view. To date, the Lane County Sheriff's Office has coordinated over 15 separate searches spanning two counties. Paid and volunteer searchers have logged over 700 hours. As recent as last weekend, search and rescue investigating yet another tip. Our KVAL news crew on the scene December 11th when items were found near a swimming hole about a mile from Hobo Campground, visible from the road in an area that Parrish says was searched multiple times. The blue ribbon right there is where Oh, oh. Two of the items were found, and then the blue and orange ribbon over here is where the other item was found. Parrish confirms the items belong to Michael. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that these items were planted. It is the unknown that weighs heavy on their hearts. Every morning during my, during my devotions, um, I pray that prodigal son story will happen for us. I do. But then I have to be realistic. The Brysons will be the first to tell you that Michael struggled with addiction, but it didn't define him. He was a good son 
and loyal friend. Michael didn't know a stranger. Michael had a heart and love for everybody that he met. Um, never judged anyone. The Brysons say they're not giving up on their son. The Facebook group Let's Find Michael Bryson is up to 20,000 followers from every state. Posts and comments give the Brysons encouragement to keep Michael's story front and center. We've got really good ideas of what's happened, um, some ideas of who was involved, and we're just waiting for that last little tip to, to open everything up. Because we just want the truth, period. We want Michael back. You will find more information on the investigation at KVAL.com. There's a link there to listen to the raw interview with Parrish and Tina Bryson. Still had a special report tonight, a closer look at what it's like to go on a date during a pandemic. I have all the details coming up in tonight's Health Watch. Plus, a live look here at Tampa, Florida. That's where the Buccaneers won Super Bowl 55 tonight. Brandon Cameraman will recap the big game. It's coming up. Today's Health Watch dating is arguably always awkward. Throw a pandemic into the mix and well, it doesn't get more awkward than that. I spoke with a student at Oregon State University who tells me COVID or not, students are dating and the Oregon Health Authority says it's okay. It's sort of being outside for a walk. It's, you know, um, it's potentially, you know, self-isolating for a little bit. Maybe it's about getting a test. And, and yes, these are very planned, um, seemingly premeditated decisions <laughs> that right. maybe take the spontaneity out of, out of, out of sure, But it's your safety right. we're talking about here. We're cracking up. But I mean, this is the new reality, right? Right, right. And so, but there, there are ways, there, there are definitely ways to do it safely and ways to keep you and your partner safe. We're no longer just talking about STDs or STIs. The new reality for all of us, especially when it comes to meeting someone, going out on a date and potentially getting intimate, is how to do so safely during a pandemic. And 23-year-old Oregon State University graduate student Jenna Brandis says it's possible. She started dating her boyfriend during COVID. I think that a lot of students have been downloading dating apps. That's what I've seen, at least. Uh, there's a definitely an increase in use of Tinder and Bumble. Two popular dating apps used on college campuses throughout the U.S. and here at Oregon State University, now complete with what Jenna calls added safety layers. They've added um, like video chatting features so you don't have to meet people in person. You can kind of do those virtual dates and you don't have to give out your phone number always, which is sometimes a safety concern. Dr. Tim Menza, the medical director for HIV, STD, and TB at the Oregon Health Authority says there are several ways you can still have sex safely, and it starts with yourself. You are your safest sex partner. OHA incorporating several sexual health suggestions for people of all ages during COVID. Some of them we've all heard before, use condoms and wash your hands. And I think so. Of course, there's people that maybe could be safer, but in general, I think people are taking those precautions and they're taking it seriously. And Even during this time, um, sexual health is important, right? Sexual health is always important. It's kind of impractical to expect that people to stop having sex completely during physical distancing. It just is. For those who choose to stay abstinent during COVID, there are several virtual ways to make friends during the pandemic. Jenna says there are virtual running clubs, yoga classes, and even online dance parties. And who knows, you might just find your soulmate when you're not looking. Well, sites of spring might be popping up across Western Oregon, but that does not mean we are out of the woods as far as the winter weather goes. Some of us could see a few snow flurries come the end of the week. We'll discuss if that's a real potential threat next on KVAL News. See you over the Willamette Valley this afternoon. A mix of sun, clouds, and a few brief showers were seen across the region. And KVAL's Chief Meteorologist Josh Cozart here to explain to us all the potential winter weather heading our way. Well, I know it's something to kind of scare you into paying attention to the forecast, but it's <laughs> nothing that we need to be too cautious of. 
right now just because it's still so far out. So let's focus on the here and now. That's where we saw temperatures climb up into the low 50s, up and down the I-5 quarter, just the same out along the coast. you got to keep in mind that's exactly where we should be for the middle of February here across western Oregon. With our current temperatures now sliding back into the low 40s, a west northwest wind at about 5 miles per hour. Humidity values slightly on the increase thanks to that cloud coverage that has rolled in overhead. And you can see that with our radar and satellite. But the dry conditions will be remaining as the next week is expecting to see better chances of rain showers over much of the Pacific Northwest. But you couple that with some colder air that's going to start to dive its way into western Oregon. But that's a far cry from our friends in the Midwest. 17 below Bismarck, Minneapolis, 4 below Chicago. Not much better at 0 degrees. That's all due to a southerly dip in our jet stream. That will retreat ever so slightly for the middle part of the week until we get to about this time next week. That's when it dives its way. A nice trough digging in. Allowing for that cold Canadian Arctic air to move into western Oregon. You couple that with the moisture potential. That's where we have the possibility for a few snowflakes to fall. But the dry weather that we saw today, all thanks to this high pressure system, that will remain overhead for at least much of tomorrow. But this next system starts to approach western Oregon. That's going to increase our cloud coverage for much of the day. So that's going to help to kind of keep temperatures at bay. We won't be seeing as much sunshine as what we saw today. And you can see that with our forecasted model here. Maybe a few snow flurries over western or I should say eastern sections of Lynn County and we will hold on to that cloud coverage not only for much of the day tomorrow but even into Tuesday with a bit of breaking up in the early morning hours just for it to return to our region. Our weather app starting to show those pesky snowflakes popping up once more. Of course your phone app a great tool to kind of give you an idea but you can't take it uh, with or you should take it with just a grain of salt as the possibility is not certain just yet. It's still just too far out. That's why we continue to look at our differing weather models. The long range forecast the pink line over the I-5 quarter. That's that rain snow potential, but a little bit more blue. That's the snowfall getting close to our communities in the valleys. And as we pay close attention to where that level is going to be dropping down close to the valley floor Saturday into Sunday with daytime highs tomorrow returning to the mid to upper 40s from the coast to the foothills of the Cascade. Eugene Springfield seven day forecast slightly drier for the next two days. Temperatures slightly below our normal of 50, but that rain snow mix. It starts to creep back in Friday, Saturday and for Valentine's Day with some cold daytime highs struggling to touch even 40 degrees. Coos Bay seven day forecast just the same morning fog to continue with Tuesday morning. The rain it starts up late Wednesday into Thursday highs into the upper 40s. Umqua Valley seven day just the same with the low 50s. We should be right around 52 degrees, but then we drop into the mid 40s as we move in, but some great photos coming in. Debbie sent this to us and be sure to download the KVAL News weather app. That's going to get you weather alerts and you can track the latest storm systems moving into our area. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Josh. Brandon Cameron joining us now with sports. Another win for Brady, Brandon. Amazing. He's the goat. The guy's the goat. We'll have a <laughs> recap from Super Bowl 55. Plus, what's next for high school football? A lot of unknowns. We'll take a deeper dive after the break. KVAL Sports Desk, sponsored by Toyota. You watched it here on KVAL, the battle of two of the greats at the quarterback position, separated by nearly 20 years in age. Tom Brady looking for his seventh Super Bowl ring, essentially hosting the Kansas City Chiefs. And Brady and Buccaneers, they just felt right at home. Just before the end of the first quarter, Brady over to who else? Rob Gronkowski, the longtime New England Patriot, former Patriot to former Patriot. That made it 7-3, and we'd see it again. Midway through the second, Brady to Gronk, and it is 14. 14-3 Tampa Bay. Just before halftime, Bucks score again. It's Antonio Brown. All Bucks in the first half and all Bucks in the second half. Gronk and Brady weren't with the Bucks last year. Neither was Antonio Brown. Same with this guy, Leonard Fournette. Four touchdowns by three guys new to Tampa Bay. Brady wins his fifth Super Bowl MVP, his seventh ring. The Bucks defense dominated Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, and Tampa Bay wins Super Bowl 55, 31 to nine. Well, Monday is an unofficial deadline. The Oregon School Activities Association is pressed to make a decision on the fate of contact sports at the high school level. I spoke with local football coaches and players who are trying their best to prepare without knowing what's next. Hard yard line. We're gonna face less. A high school football practice that sounds different. How are you feeling today? Any different than yesterday? And looks different. 
Social distancing, masks, and oh yeah, it's February. We've had some really good practices the last three weeks, and, and I'm looking for next week to ramp it up and try to go four days a week, but we need the we need the guidance to be changed a little bit. But therein lies the rub. Right now, all local football teams can do is socially distanced conditioning. Right now, we're st staying six feet apart. We're just conditioning, basically, no contact at all. That's because the governor has a ban on contact sports. It's been pretty tough just because you're not allowed to, you know, have that same interaction that you used to have. We're aware that there are conversations um, regarding uh, contact sports occurring. What exactly those are and, and if that's going to lead to a change, you know, that we don't know. And not knowing is one of the biggest issues. You know, to be honest with you, the lines of communication are, they, there's a million crossed wires right now. Um, you know, everybody uh, is talking and no one really knows what's going on. Like a game of telephone. I think for us, it's kind of that balance between, you know, wanting to make a decision, but also wanting to wait as long as possible so that we can get the decision that we want. The decision to play. With these coming practices, um, we've still kept that hope that there'll still be a season and, you know, that drive still keeps us going every day. It's not like we're going to just quit. And so they practice or condition following protocols and they wait. Oregon's one of only three states without the approval to play contact football. I reached out to the governor's office to see if she had plans to lift the ban on contact sports, something the OSAA hope and hopes happens tomorrow. The governor didn't have an answer for me. I was told they would keep us posted. If Governor Brown does not lift the contact sports ban, the OSAA will look for alternatives, which could include flag football. So a lot we are still waiting for as this week moves on, but certainly tomorrow's a big day to see if anything changes with the fate of high school sports. All right. Definitely, I can only imagine. Flag football, wow. That's something I might be able to be do. Be different. Versus tackle. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. Thanks, Brandon. Still ahead tonight, the weekend takes center stage at the Super Bowl 55. Still ahead tonight, the weekend takes center stage at the Super Bowl 55 halftime show. A closer look at his performance alongside the bandaged army. KVAL News. The weekend takes center stage during tonight's Super Bowl halftime show. The bandages were back, but worn by his backup dancers this time, his bandaged army. The Grammy winning singer performed a medley of hits, including what you just heard, Can't Feel My Face, and Earned It. Ahead of the performance, the weekend explained there would be no surprise guests due to COVID-19 protocols. He also recently explained what the bandages are all about, saying the bandages, quote, reflect on the absurd culture of Hollywood celebrity and people manipulating themselves for superficial reasons to play Please and be validated. Wow, a lot of artistic meaning there. A lot going on. Yeah. Another I still weekend. don't understand the weekend being spelled without the E, right? Yes, I, you know, fun fact I just learned tonight. I guess I'm just too old now. Can't keep up with the kids, right? You can quickly just find him ah, instead of actually looking gosh, at the weekend. You get it. Ah. So the question is, who wins this year's Puppy Bowl? Well, you have to stay tuned. Learn more about who won and who was adopted this year. Puppy Bowl 17 is officially underway. <laughs> the Puppy Bowl back this year with COVID protocols. More than 70 puppies from 22 different shelters joined in. They were split into two teams. You have the rough team and the fluff team. And this year, it was all rough with the win this year. For the first 16 years, every puppy featured in the bowl was adopted. That is so cute. Great I like deal, to hear that huh? at the end too. Yeah, I would really like think that. Bowl. Yeah, Team Rough is gonna win all the time, right? They're well. rough, rough and tumble <laughs> over. Really? Well, sometimes finesse gets that. it done. That's a good you know. point. I guess you're right. Hey, let's take one more look at that seven-day forecast real quick. We do have a rain-snow mix that does return to the region starting Friday night into the weekend, so that's great for any travelers out there. But it's gonna be cold. We thank you for watching this special edition of KVAL News on Sunday night. That we do. We'll be back for KVAL News at 11.